Hello students, in this video we'll prove the Sturm comparison theorem for two ordinary differential equations that have solutions that oscillate in certain intervals. Let's consider two self-adjoint ODEs, second order ODEs. The first OD we're going to consider is going to be P y prime prime plus q y equals zero. I'm going to call it q1 actually. And I'm going to consider this equation p, same p, y prime prime plus q2 y equals zero. I'll call this one over here equation one and this one over here equation number two. Let's let and the assumptions we're going to make are the typical assumptions that P is continuously differentiable, Q1 and Q2 are continuous, and I, know, I would like P also to be greater than or equal to zero. So that's an important assumption over here is that we want to make sure that we don't have sign disparities so we can actually construct oscillatory solutions to these things. So in both these cases, P is greater than or equal to zero on the intervals that we're going to consider. Okay? Great. And so what's the result? The result is the following. So this is a theorem due to Sturm. It's a very important theorem about containing oscillations. So Sturm's theorem. And what does it state? It states the following. It states that if y1 solves equation 1 and y2 solves 2, then let's suppose actually, we don't want to say then yet, and Let's say that Q2 is strictly greater than Q1 on an interval AB. Okay, I'm going to assume that Y1 solves equation one and Y2 solves equation two everywhere, right? So we're gonna focus on the interval AB. Then if zeta one and zeta two are two consecutive roots, of y1, and these zeta1 and zeta2 are going to be somewhere in the interval ab. Then, and consecutive just means what, of course? Consecutive, as we know, means that y1 of zeta1 equals y1 of zeta2 is equal to zero. Zeta1, let's say that zeta1 is less than zeta2, and y1 of x is not equal to zero on the interval zeta 1 to zeta 2, like that. That was what it means to be consecutive. Okay? Good. And then what can we say? If I have two consecutive zeros of the function y1, then the solution y2 is going to have to vanish somewhere in zeta 1 and zeta 2, right? Then y, y2 has a root on the interval in zeta 1 to zeta 2, like that. Okay? Now, of course, the assumptions are going to force certain sign conditions on, um, on Q1 and Q2, right? This is just saying if there happens to be root, then this must happen, right? It might be the case that these things don't have roots at all, right? So we're in the situation when we're assuming they have a roots. And, of course, I can easily construct examples. Like the, tr the trigonometric examples are typical examples, trigonometric functions, where Q1 is equal to n squared, Q2 is equal to m squared. Those give us good examples of where this theorem would hold in sort of a particular example, okay? So let's prove this theorem. And so let's think of that example, actually. So what would that example give us? So here's an example, right? The example I think in the back of our mind is, if I look at y double prime plus n squared, y is equal to zero, and y double prime plus m squared, y is equal to zero. Here my q1 is gonna be, q1 is gonna be n squared, and, q, and q2 is gonna be m squared. So in this situation, m is greater than n, right? So in other words, I have a strictly bigger function on any interval over here. Well, of course, the solutions to this equation over here are going to be, let's just look at one particular example. I can look at one particular example. I'd have like, the sine of nx would solve this over here. And then if I looked at this equation over here, I'd have y was equal to the sine of mx, right? And then, of course, what's the spacing of the roots over here? The root spacing is like pi over n, and the root spacing over here 
is pi over m, right? And of course, since m is bigger than n, there's more roots over here of this function over here than there are of that function. So for every one over m, the one over m oscillation is going to occur within that within that region over there. So this one, os this function oscillates more. And so in some sense, this Sturm theorem over here is a comparison of relative oscillations if one of the sort of forcing functions is larger than the other. Okay, excellent. So that's our example we want to keep in the back of our mind. And so now how do we prove this theorem? So proof, suppose that y2 of x was not equal to zero in the interval zeta 1 to zeta 2, right? And then without loss of generality, since I know that um, y of zeta 1 and zeta 2 are greater than 0, there are only simple zeros by the fact that the Ron scheme can't vanish anywhere in between them, so I know that I can assume without loss of generality that these functions, at, that the, if that's zeta 1 and zeta 2, I can assume without loss of generality that they're both greater than or equal to 0 there. I can assume that that's my y1, and I can also assume that y2 is greater than zero. Maybe it looks something like that. Right? So without loss of generality, y1 is strictly greater than zero, and y2 is strictly greater than zero in the interval zeta 1 to zeta 2. Like that. Excellent. OK. And of course, the other cases follow from similar reasoning. They're both negative. You can run the same argument if they have alternating signs of the same argument. It's just basically, this is going to be a sign-catching argument. And so we're going to try to keep track of all the signs and violate get a something is positive and something is negative argument. So by changing, these, by changing this order over here, you can run this argument with any sort of combination of different signs. OK? Excellent. All right. And so now what's the idea? So now the idea is the following. So I'm going to consider, as we typically do in the Sturm theory, consider P and then y2, y1 prime minus y1, y2 prime, prime. Well, what will this give us over here? So this is going to give us, if we multiply this out, we're just going to see that by the typical expression over here, we're going to want, we want to isolate terms that look like this, right? So if we do the derivative, the, the derivatives that won't, the derivatives that will cancel, if I put a derivative on y2 over here and put a derivative on y1 over there, those are going to cancel out because it'll be the same terms. If I put the derivative on py1 prime or py2 prime, then I can use these relationships over here. So if I plug this into the equation over here, we're exactly going to see that by doing this differentiation, we see that this is going to be q2 minus q1 and then y1, y2. Like that. Okay? So that's the Sturm identity. So this is sometimes called the Legendre identity. Yeah, that's the Legendre identity. And now we're going to integrate the Legendre identity from zeta 1 to zeta 2. So if we integrate that, we're going to get on the left hand side, we're going to get p and then y2, y1 prime minus y1, y2 prime evaluated from zeta 1 to zeta 2. Okay. And then over here, what we're going to have, we're going to have the integral from zeta 1 to zeta 2 of q2. Let's just let's put the arguments in here q2 of x minus q1 of x, and then y1 of x, y2 of x, dx. And now let's stop and think about the sign of this integral over here. I know that q2 is bigger than q1, so that term is positive on this whole interval over here. And I know that y1 and y2 are assumed to be positive by the initial assumption. Again, if they're, if, if they're both negative, I'm still going to maintain that same sign, right? So no matter what the case we're in, this expression over here is strictly greater than 0, right? Because I'm assuming everything is strictly greater than 0 on that interval. So when you integrate a strictly positive function, you get something that's strictly greater than 0, OK? Now, what's going to happen over here? Our underlying assumption is that p is always greater than or equal to 0, right? So let's look at these terms over here. So I have p y2 y1 prime of zeta 2, and then minus p y2 uh, y2 y1 prime of what? Of zeta 2. Uh, so what do we have so, of zeta 1, right? I'm plugging the bottom of it now. Zeta 1, OK. And then we'll have a what? Then we'll have a plus the bottom limit. So plus the bottom limit over here is going to be p, uh, p y1, y2 prime, zeta, uh, zeta 2. Let's make sure we get all the signs right, actually. So I plug in this over here. I'm going to get the zeta 2. I plug in, um, let's make sure we're doing this correctly. So then I plug in a zeta 1 to the top over here. That's correct. 
That's the bottom limit. So now I plug in the top limit is going to get a negative sign, right? Because we're over here now. And the bottom limit gets a positive sign. So that's going to be a zeta 1. And then minus p y 1 y 2 prime of zeta 2. Okay. If I just plug in those limits over here. Now let's stop and think what happens. So these terms over here are positive, right? These terms over here are positive. These terms over here are positive, and these terms over here are positive. Now think about why one prime and why two prime are gonna are gonna give us over here. So what's happening? Well, what does y1 prime of zeta 2 look like? That's gonna be negative expression over here. So that expression's negative. Why so? Because if we're if we have a root over here, look at y1. Y1's gonna be going up like that. So y1 prime at zeta 2 is over here. That's going to be negative. So this term over here is negative. That's a negative term over there. What about this term over here? y1 prime is positive, so that's going to be a positive term over here, right? And now what are we assuming? We're assuming that you're never equal to 0, so that you're strictly greater than or equal to 0 in this interval over here, so you get the same re by exactly the same reason these things flip over here. So now the y2 prime of zeta 1 is going to be what? That's going to be negative, and that's going to be negative over there, so this whole thing is negative, less than or equal to 0. And so now we've shown that 0 this expression is equal to zero, and it's strictly less than or equal to zero, less than or equal to zero, but strictly positive. That's a contradiction, right? So we have a contradiction over here, and that says that what? That y two has to vanish somewhere in that interval over there. So in other words, y two. So hence, y two of x c is equal to zero for some x c in zeta one and zeta two. And it follows from this Legendre identity and integrating and in, in, you violate the sign. So in other words, if there's more oscillation on this, if that Q2 is bigger, that means there's more oscillation if there is a root at all. And that if it's bigger than Q1, then what will happen is that the root of Q, of the roots that, ha that come from y the Y1 equation, will have to intersperse with the roots of the Y2 equation, because the Y2 equation has more oscillation than the Y1 equation. Thank you very much.